And we will start with uh, Francisco talk on Christian philosophy as an existential habitus. Hello, everyone. My name is Francisco Plaza. I'm from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. And my paper today is a defense of Christian philosophy following Jacques Maritain's understanding of it as an intellectual and existential habitus. While many Catholic philosophers have advocated for Christian philosophy in the past century, particularly against the aggressive secularism of contemporary philosophy, there have been some, even within the Catholic sphere, that have questioned the possibility of its existence altogether. The typical challenge lies in the use of the term Christian. How exactly does Christian modify philosophy? Is it a separate branch, such as ethics or metaphysics? If that is the case, what is the object or scope of this science? Critics are quick to point out here the seeming absurdity of proposing a Christian mathematics or Christian biology. Perhaps it refers instead to a different method for engaging in philosophy. In this case, how does it remain as philosophy if faith is introduced at the starting point? Are the advocates of Christian philosophy guilty of covertly transforming philosophy into theology? At the heart of these questions is a matter of faith and reason altogether, how they are distinct and how they complement one another. In this paper, we shall propose Jacques Maritain's solution to these difficulties, as his explanation of Christian philosophy remains among the best on the subject. Maritain explained that the key to understanding Christian philosophy is to think of it not as a separate science, but as a reference to the existential state of the Christian who pursues philosophy. In other words, it points to the habitus of philosophy within the Christian philosopher as a person, which is a lived experience and practice of philosophy on the part of the Christian. This has more to do with the intellectual virtue within the philosopher rather than philosophy as a science in the abstract. Thus, while philosophy itself as a science in the abstract sense remains the same, the outcome is different depending upon the philosopher. And this is not because the science itself changes, but because of the particular differences and existential considerations on the part of the philosophers themselves. To be clear, by Christian philosophy, we cannot mean the assumption of precepts given by revelation, wherein they would form parts of the logical arguments offered by the philosopher. If we begin with revealed truths from a logical standpoint, there would be no true distinction between philosophy and theology. Yet, the Christian does, in fact, use revealed truth to aid in his understanding of truth as a whole. So, how is this to be reconciled? In his book, Science and Wisdom, Maritain wrote the following on the matter, quote, We need to distinguish the nature of philosophy from its state. In other words, we need to distinguish the order of specification from the order of exercise. Considered in its pure nature or essence, philosophy, which is specified by an object naturally knowable to reason, depends only on the evidence and criteria of natural reason. But here, we are only considering its abstract nature, taken concretely in the sense of being a habitus or a group of habitus existing in the human soul, philosophy is in a certain state, is either pre-Christian or Christian or a Christian, which has a decisive influence on the way in which it exists and develops. Thus, when we speak of Christian philosophy, we are making an existential claim about the practitioner of the science not an abstract claim in which we define a new science of philosophy. When the term Christian philosophy is challenged today, it is typically done by those who think of it as an abstract category, rather than in this existential state that Maritain is describing. The key is to focus on the philosopher, not philosophy as such. We can see a simple illustration of Maritain's point if we consider even the differences among our fellow philosophers in our own lives. 
Some of our colleagues choose to focus on ethical questions, while others are more inclined toward metaphysical ones. The impetus for such inclinations is in many ways pre-philosophical. When philosophers are asked why they chose to focus on one thing rather than another, they typically point to something within their lived experience outside of philosophy, properly speaking, which accounts for this. Consider then how much more these differences are magnified when comparing a Christian to an atheist philosopher. More importantly, from the Christian standpoint, there are certain truths which the atheist philosopher will miss precisely on account of these existential considerations. For instance, Maritain argued that only the Christian will be able to produce a moral philosophy adequately considered, that is, one which gives the complete answer to what moral philosophy seeks, namely, the true path to complete happiness or beatitude. The force of Maritain's answer, then, is not merely in accounting for the differences among philosophers of different faiths, but in his argument that only the Christian philosopher will reach a certain level of wisdom. To be clear, Maritain's claim here applies to sciences which have an overlap with, with religion based upon the matter being discussed. This is why there is a prima facie absurdity with a hypothetical Christian mathematics or Christian biology. The scope of such sciences, quantified matter and living matter, does not have a shared concern with religion, whereas philosophy, on the other hand, does. As Maritain explained in Ransoming the Time, quote, philosophy, however, though distinct from Christianity, is in interrelation with it and must deal with matters pertaining to religion if it is to understand and analyze concretely the problems of human life and human conduct, not after the fashion of any necessary requirement but after the fashion of a concrete and existential suitability. The natural manifestation of the eternal word, or logos, in which philosophy is rooted, in a certain sense, invokes a supernatural manifestation of the incarnate word, that is, Christ as logos incarnate, in which faith is rooted. We've added the Greek term logos here for clarification purposes, since... This was the original term used that calls to mind eternal truth, rationality, order, etc. Of course, in the Christian setting, this is linked with Christ himself in the Gospel of St. John. What this suggests is a connection between God, and especially Christ, with truth. Logos is more than just truth in being, but also truth through reasoning, the essence of wisdom. This is ultimately what philosophy is after, and what makes philosophy possible in the first place. Through Logos, then, there is a natural connection between Christianity and philosophy. Traditionally, it has been understood that the philosopher not only seeks truth, but also searches for truth that transforms his way of life. Moreover, the philosopher, as a lover of wisdom, will wish to make use of all available data in this search for ultimate truth. Professor Raymond Dennehy explained Maritain's position as such, quote, owing to the limitations of the human condition, the imperfection of our understanding, the fact that we are confined to sensible things for our evidence, etc., unaided reason cannot in itself give us the ultimate and complete truth. Now, Maritain does not regard philosophy as a merely conceptual experience. It is for him a search for truth which, to the extent that it is discovered, transforms one's entire life. End quote. From this perspective, it would not make sense for the philosopher to ignore religious input, not for the sake of his arguments necessarily, but for the sake of his own never-ending search for the truth. Professor Dennehy continued, quote, if he, namely the philosopher, finds a source of higher truth or truth which he believes cannot be grasped by unaided reason, then just because he is dedicated to the truth, he incorporates it into his life. But if this higher truth cannot be grasped by reason alone, then it cannot, according to Maritain, 
be fused with philosophy, which relies on unaided reason to form a single unified discipline, end quote. This is in keeping with what we have explained prior, namely, that the Christian philosopher incorporates revealed truth into his life, and this has a natural impact on his thinking. But as a philosopher, it is not fused with philosophical arguments themselves unless these truths can be shown from the vantage point of unaided natural human reason as well. Essentially, this is the harmonious relation between faith and reason understood by the Catholic, with the end being that faith and reason must fly together as much as possible. Indeed, there are certain mysteries of the faith that require revelation, such as Christ's dual nature of God and man. And to some extent, these will elude most rational explanations. With that being said, the Christian, in particular the philosopher and the theologian, will attempt to find the logic in these revealed truths to the best of their abilities. However, the philosopher has the specific task of attempting this within the confines of natural human reason alone. In other words, while the Christian philosopher comes to accept revealed truth through faith as a Christian, he would, as a philosopher, try to find a way to express the same truth without the aid of revelation in his own work. Now, whether we are talking about speculative or practical philosophy does make a bit of difference in this consideration as well. We can agree that a hypothetical Christian mathematics does not seem to make sense, while Christian ethics does. What about Christian metaphysics? This seems a bit trickier. Again, in this case, there seems to be a shared concern between the metaphysician and the Christian, especially the theologian. But how much does revelation truly impact metaphysical conclusions? Let us conclude then with the following clarification. Maritain considered that speculative philosophy possesses a degree of autonomy from theology that practical philosophy does not. Then he explained that Maritain held this position because the search for wisdom has a dynamism. The lower wisdom seeks the higher wisdom. In other words, since the subject matter of metaphysics is being insofar as it is being, it is rightfully called first philosophy since there's nothing more universal than being qua being. Moral philosophy, however, is less universal, as it is concerned specifically with the human good. So, from a hierarchical standpoint, Maritain argued that moral philosophy is subalternated to theology on account of its shared end. Professor Ralph Nelson has a very clear explanation for what Maritain means exactly by moral philosophy adequately considered. He wrote, quote, What precisely does Maritain mean by an adequate moral philosophy? Maritain employs this term with the meaning it possesses in the Thomistic definition of truth as adequatio re et intellectus. A moral philosophy adequately considered is moral philosophy taken as constituting purely and simply, simpliciter, a true moral science in a state which makes the mind of itself adequate to or in conformity with its object, that is to say, human action. A moral science inadequately considered would be one which is not adequate to this object and hence not a science in the Aristotelian sense of the term. It will be inadequate, says Maritain, if it is in ignorance of the concrete conditions within which human nature, as it actually exists, is placed in its journey toward its end. Historically, we have been presented with two important examples of moral philosophies which are inadequate in this way, the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle and Ecclesiastes." End quote. The completion of moral philosophy for Maritain, as for St. Thomas Aquinas, requires the import of revelation for the final answer, so to speak. But this is not 
want to say that there is no natural philosophical content to speak of. For example, there is still virtue, natural law, happiness in this life that is imperfect happiness. So we can summarize then that moral philosophy from Maritain's perspective can only go so far from the vantage point of natural reason alone. And indeed, it can go far, but its absolute completion requires supernatural truth to reveal what lies ahead. This complete form of moral philosophy would be what Maritain thought of as moral philosophy adequately considered, and it is a clear example of what makes Christian philosophy. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Now we can uh, ask some questions. I can see that we have some questions already on the streams, but we will start with the questions uh, on site. Do we have any? Mm, if not, we can go to the questions from the participants on WebEx. Uh, do you have any questions here uh, in the room one? Uh, any ideas on Christian philosophy as, as an existential habitus? Um, okay, uh, I will read the questions we already received, and if some of you will, will have a question, just please raise your hand or let me know in the chat. So there are three three questions. Francisca, I will read them one by one, uh, just to make sure that everyone every every one of them is is answered. The first question is a bit long. Uh, regarding the idea of defining the Christian philosophy by its scope. Would you classify the philosopher investigating the Christianity with philosophical tools, its history or theology, and draw philosophical conclusions as a Christian philosopher? Therefore, Nietzsche, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Law, or Hitchens would be a Christian philosophers. And by the way, if we speak about Christian philosophy, would we have also a concept of anti-Christian philosophy? We could then classify aforementioned philosophers as such. Just please unmute yourself to, to answer this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I unmuted you, so, so go on. All right, thank you. Um, I think that, so if I, if I understood the question right, uh, the first part seems to suggest that by talking about Christianity, that this is somehow part of Christian philosophy. Is that correct? Okay. So I would say in response to that, and then the, the next part I know is about, about the possibility of anti-Christian philosophy, but I, I want to take this in two parts. So I don't think that uh, to say that Christian philosophy is talking about Christianity, I don't, I don't think that that's quite right. Uh, that's certainly not the way that Maritain is conceiving of it here. It's not so much that the subject matter of Christian philosophy is, um, you know, Christianity itself, that, that seems more to suggest that uh, the kind of view that I was talking about at the beginning of the paper of uh, trying to paint Christian philosophy as its own kind of separate science. So the way that Maritain is setting it up here, that wouldn't be quite right, because philosophy is philosophy. Uh, the Christian philosophy aspect of it is really more of a statement about the philosopher himself that's practicing it, not so much uh, what you're looking at in, in this kind of narrow sense of saying, oh, well, you're talking about Christianity, so that's what we mean by uh, Christian philosophy. You know, instead, I think we could say that if you're talking about Christianity, uh, maybe you'd want to say that we're, we're discussing the philosophy of religion as it pertains to Christianity, but that's much different than this kind of consideration of what the Christian philosopher actually is. Okay, so uh, as far as anti-Christian philosophy, I think that you could think of it in the similar way. Uh, let's say that from the Christian standpoint, you know, what if you have one, let's say like Nietzsche was brought up as an example, perhaps another example would be Marx, where they have an opposition to Christianity and... Uh, if, let's say, that Christianity is true and Maritain is right in, his, in how he's talking about this, 
then what we're led to think for the Christian philosopher is that there is a certain level of truth or wisdom that is attained because of the help of this virtue, if it is indeed virtuous and true, right? Now, the consequence of that would be that for, let's say, the anti-Christian philosopher, however you want to paint him, then he's moving away from truth, right? So uh, what would happen here is you you would have somebody that is moving away from the logos, somebody that is rebelling against the logos for whatever reason, right? And if that's the case, then yes, it, it shouldn't surprise us from the standpoint of uh, a Christian philosopher that the conclusions that they're going to reach are far away from what the truth actually is. That, that's kind of how we would think about it. Okay, um, there are more and more questions. I will, I, I'll try to read uh, a few more. Uh, the question below is, uh, below the, 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 the previous one, is if, if you would therefore distinguish Christian philosophy by its method, what would you defer from theology? Okay. So here I think that... Uh, Method is a tricky word to use because we could talk about, uh, you know, that, that's how you could distinguish analytical philosophy from non-analytical philosophy. You could say that analytical philosophy refers to a particular method. Now, you know, that's putting aside the fact that within practice, there's a tradition of analytic philosophy that has reached certain conclusions, right? But I'm putting that aside. Now, I don't think that this is quite the same as Christian philosophy, because uh, when Maritain is talking about it, it seems to me that the method is essentially the same. The only difference really has to do with, let's say, the skill or the level of wisdom that the philosopher himself reaches. But he's really doing philosophy more or less the same way. And I think that this is important because uh, you're correct in thinking that if we're thinking of it as a strict method, as a distinct method, then what that would imply is that you are using faith as uh, premises or premises taken from faith as part of your philosophical investigation. And if that is indeed the case, then we're going to fall into the mistake of just theologizing philosophy. Then I think it would be, in fact, fair to say that you're just talking about theology at that point. So uh, I think that's the distinction that, that I would make there. Okay, uh, there is one more question below the previous one, which I think sheds some light on it. Uh, I will read it. The quotation mark. There is no Christian math, but there is a Christian ethics. The end of quotation. So you say that in every area of human activity, that includes some axiology, there can be distinguished its Christian type. Am I right? Can you repeat that uh, last part again? Um, so you say that in every area of human activity, which includes some axiology, there can be distinguished its Christian type. Okay, I think I understand. So I, I think that the difference here would be that uh, what moral philosophy is after, the, the way that Maritain is describing it, it is fair to say that it is subalternated to theology on account of a shared end. Now, uh, this is kind of a finer distinction, right? But this is why uh, Christian ethics is said to make sense more than something like Christian mathematics, because what could be the shared end? Answer is that on account of the shared end, right? Uh, this is something that I think is clear if you go back to the beginning of uh, the Prima Secunde. When we talk about imperfect happiness, you know, it seems to me that uh, what Aquinas is doing is he's building much of his ethical system on that of Aristotle. Now, uh, there's a shared end between the two here, but we have to acknowledge that 
as a pagan, there's going to be a limit to uh, what Aristotle is going to reach, right? Now, if you are a Christian, on the other hand, see, this is where it gets tricky because it's very easy to slip into... Uh, Francisco, we can't hear you for some reason. I don't know whether this is the internet or... Right. Is there anything within this life without necessarily uh, relying on premises of faith, right? Is there anything that we can take from that that uh, we don't need to rely on as an authority? So in, in other words, we know as Christians that our supernatural end is beyond this world. So let me give you an example of how that might affect political philosophy, just real quick. So uh, for somebody that's an atheist like Marx, it makes sense for them to try to seek the perfect end in this world because they don't believe that anything lies beyond the next. Now for the Christian, on the other hand, if we believe that there is this afterlife, that there's a supernatural end beyond the temporal, then we're not going to place politics as this supreme system. We're not going to seek perfection in this world because we know that, well, this is going to be a search that's in vain. Now, the question for the philosopher here is, can we justify that truth only as a Christian, or are there philosophical reasons that will allow us, within the confines of natural reason, to be able to hold that position as well. And so that's what I think the Christian philosopher has to do, is just to get into that uh, little middle ground where you can answer that, right, something that you know as a Christian, but with this justification of natural reason. And, and I think just to say very generally, uh, what, what is a sketch of how you might be able to do that? Well, for example, for what we're talking about here, it would be an adequate metaphysical consideration of the contingencies of this world, you know, something like that. So you could take that avenue to be able to say that uh, even from just a philosophical standpoint, taking religion out of it, there are reasons why somebody like Marx is wrong, even just from a, a metaphysical standpoint, that doesn't have to do with these kind of faith premises. But let's say that in your own personal life as a philosopher, what got you to that point or what helped you philosophy to reach that and that's that's what Maritain's talking about it's more on the level of virtue not so much the method and the science Okay, Francisco, just two last question. This will be a very quick one. I love this question. Um, so the question I received is, can there be a Christian practicing philosophy which is not Christian? <laughs> That's interesting. So uh, I think that we have many examples of people, especially today, that like to study, you know, things like Eastern philosophy even, even though they're Christian in their own life. Now, I think that there's nothing wrong with this in the sense that uh, we're not, not so naive as to say, I think, that, I think it's fair to say, right, that the position that we're presenting is not that only the Christian has access to the truth in such a way that anyone who is not a Christian has absolutely, you know, nothing to say at all. Uh, I think that the way that truth and, you know, Logos, let's say. The way that this works is uh, clearly um, you can find inklings of this within various traditions. And so how might you as a Christian study non-Christian philosophy, which I think all of us do, especially when we read, I mean, I myself reading Marx or something like that. Now, obviously, I'm going to read Marx with a critical eye. And I think that's kind of the key, right? That as a Christian, obviously, there are going to be certain things with non-Christian traditions that will be incompatible with your own. So if the question would be, well, can you as a Christian hold incompatible philosophical views? I think that there we'd have a disagreement, right? There we'd have a problem. But how about uh, can you as a Christian 
looked for, not just even, you know, purely for critical, for the sake of criticism, but uh, can you pick up truths from non-Christian philosophers? And I think that we'd have to say, yes, we do that all the time. I mean, we certainly, as Thomas, do that with Plato and Aristotle. Okay, thank you for this question. We have a last question uh, from the audience on site, Father Darius. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Francisco, for your presentation. I liked that you stressed the role of logos, um, and uh, especially saying that logos is more than truth. My question is, um, in your opinion, logos is uh, very constitutive for Christian philosophy, or this is more contingent because of this uh, encountering of Christianity with Greek philosophy at the very beginning of, of, of Christian doctrine? Um, can you repeat the, the last part of your question? I, I want to make sure that I, I caught that. With, with regard to logos. Uh, structure logos within the Christian philosophy, is it the very content and very constitutive idea of Christian philosophy, or Logos is just historical and contingent term which happened to function in Christian philosophy? Oh, I see. I, I see. I think that uh, the way that I'm, I'm viewing Logos is, of course, there's the Greek import of the term, which uh, we could, you know, point back as early as Heraclitus and talking about this sense of uh, a kind of divine order or eternal truth, overall truth of everything. And uh, I don't, I, I don't think that this is merely, um, I don't want to reduce it to just this idea of uh, truth in a, in a very general sense or in a fancy way. Um, the reason why I'm using it is specifically because for the Christian, right, uh, beyond just this philosophical or scientific order of things, um, Christ himself is the Logos incarnate. So I think that there is something to be said for this as far as how this should impact uh, the way that we view Christian philosophy in the sense that uh, should this make a difference, right? Because if we're just talking about truth in a scientific way, then uh, why even, you know, why even bother to use that term and why not just talk about truth in general, right? Or, or uh, in, a, in a kind of reduced way, perhaps the way that a, an analytic might say it, right? That it's just meaning, the meaning between the mind and the object. I think that for the Christian, this sense of logos is, uh, it, it ties to what Maritain is talking about with the sense of virtue as well. In other words, it allows us to think that not only am I trying as a philosopher to, uh, to understand truth, but that there's a, also even a personal connection with this truth. There's a kind of personal interaction with, with this order. So in other words, it's not just that my mind is apprehending something in the transcendent, but even that there's, uh, even beyond that practice, some kind of uh, interpersonal relationship or contact between myself and being, and logos, right? And so I think that that awareness as a Christian philosopher can take us a bit further because we could even think, for example, of, uh, let's say, uh, Aquinas's formulation of God as um, subsistent being, right? Something like this. It's easy as a metaphysician to just stay within the abstract consideration of this, but I think as a Christian, we could take that even further and denote that you know, what this really means for us is that it, it shows us just how God is present to all of us as Christians, as being itself. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that it's not just that this is a metaphysical idea. It's that for a Christian, existentially considered, it means that all of us as beings are participating in this universal of being itself. So there's a link at every single moment that we exist, God is maintaining us in existence. Right. So that that's kind of what I'm getting at here, that there is that existential consideration. And so I think that uh, when we start thinking about these things as Christian philosophers, 
that's the avenue or that that's the way that propels us further into our religious and practice of theology too, right? So that's where there's a kind of uh, natural jumping point for us as Christian philosophers into thinking about religious matters and, and theology as well. 